Welcome to another episode of Threads of Enlightenment. And as usual, it is with honor and that we accept our uh, invitation from our guests. And we know that their time is precious and their journey also is precious. And yet they have entrusted us with an audience to hear their journey. And Sylvia, I want to thank you for coming to Threads of Enlightenment to spend this precious time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited. And I'm, I'm already loving this conversation because the, the pre-conversation, guys, was really, really good. So I'm <laughs> excited for the interview. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Sylvia, you talk to them. Tell them about what you have created because, as I mentioned to you, I tell my audience, creators never stay stationary. They cannot. Um, it is in their hybrid once they have been exposed to be on a continual perpetual movement because movement attracts. If you study the laws, it, it, it attracts, uh, um, uh, uh, blessings and all the other things that come with it. Talk to them about your creation. My creations are many. Um, my creations started uh, at a very young age, but now as a speaker, I um, created a book called Journey to Me, Trust the Wisdom of Change as the pandemic was hitting Austin, Texas. I'm based out of Austin, Texas, and I had the privilege of receiving a prompting to write my book because it was time and to trust my higher source, which in my case is God. And I put pen to paper. And I wrote the book and it's available internationally. It's available nationally here in the United States, anywhere online. And I'm also a trained and certified speaker with the John Maxwell team. And that came through another prompting in 2017. Um, I speak on several stages. I do virtual speaking engagements or I'll do in person now that we're able to get back mm -hmm. in person. Um, and it's been my privilege to be a speaker since 2017. And, and the wide range of topics I can speak on are connection, how to better connect to, to our teams, how to um, identify what's at the root cause of what's keeping us stuck in a, a repeated pattern of stuck, any patterns of behavior. Those are my, my topics of choice. But more importantly, on turning points and how you can use turning points to really shift the lens of your life and to understand whether you're operating from what I call ego identity or soul identity. And it, it really gives us that space to speak about that. Um, I'm also a turning points coach. So I have uh, masterminds that I give on my book, Journey to Me. And I also give masterminds on uh, John Maxwell books because I'm certified to do that. And masterminds are incredible opportunities for people to gather, people that are like-minded, like-valued individuals, small groups, where they can get vulnerable for the next six weeks and they have accountability uh, to do so. And what I do with my book is I uh, pick chapters that are relatable to their journeys because everybody's journey is different and, and the changes they're undergoing are different. Mm -hmm. So I want to tailor it to my audience and that's usually how I I create and operate. I usually interview people prior to the mastermind to get an understanding of the of what's going on in their life. I also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching, uh, which are usually six months to a year, depending, because coaching is a it's it's a more of a long-term gig for those that um, are interested in really understanding what's at the root cause. And, and sometimes we've got to go dive back into childhood because in childhood is where some of these limits and beliefs are formed. And once people understand why they are uh, reacting or getting triggered or why they're acting in certain patterns of behavior and, and it reaches a conscious awareness, yeah, and that usually takes some time to do that. So I have some six-week programs. I have m uh, monthly programs, depending on how people want to do this, or six months to a year, depending on the long term goals that they want so th that's how i create ken that is awesome I, I love your presentation as to all the details and guys if you are listening from the onset as she goes in and she's talking about these points um i can't wait to get into the conversation because i know the reason why she can talk about it is because she has experienced it so 
Um, let's go, Sylvia, and talk to me about your childhood. We, on the onset of the program, I mentioned to you that I believe we're all in, um, living from a state of trauma. I believe the earth is traumatized and we are seeing, uh, what that classic behavior of someone in trauma is about just by looking at the, the planet itself. So talk to me about your family lifestyle. How was it? How many siblings? that type of things, and where and how the programming began in your life? Well, the programming began in childhood. I actually wrote about this in Journey to Me. Chapter 1 talks about the trauma and why trauma leads to the creation of these limiting beliefs and why we call them limiting beliefs, guys, for those listening, is that these beliefs are fear-based beliefs that get formed at the moment of trauma Mm -hmm. And they get attached to a feeling. And that feeling uh, is what drives these reactions, these triggers, these patterns of behavior. And any time that feeling shows up in our life is when is when we get in trouble <laughs> because yep. of trauma. We're constantly living out our trauma, right? So yes. at the age of seven, uh, I had a traumatic experience. I come from uh, two Mexican-born immigrant parents. They raised us in South Texas. I'm the oldest of three. Um, I'm older to my younger sister, who is five years younger than me, so I'm 47 right now. So <laughs> now you know. Mm -hmm. And at the age of seven, so 40 years ago, we were on vacation. And my dad had promised us that we would see snow. And we came from South Texas. There is no snow. <laughs> South <laughs> Texas is a very <laughs> tropical area where we grew up. Um, speaking Spanish. And so we were traveling with our family in, outside of Mexico City in a, the dormant volcano Popocatépetl, for those that are listening. And as we started to climb the summit, uh, some of us got dizzy, right? My mom mm -hmm. and my aunts and cousins. And so some of them started to walk down. My dad wanted uh, to continue going down. And I put my hands on my hips and I was a very strong little child. And I told my dad, but you woke us up at 5 a.m. and you promised us we would see <laughs> snow. Mm -hmm. And so my dad gave in to my seven-year-old demands, and we mm -hmm. kept climbing. And who we kept climbing was myself and my younger brother, Jose, who's just a year younger than me, so he was six at the time, and my baby sister, Roxanne, who we lovingly called Roxy. Mm -hmm. And she was two. And we had aunts and uncles that climbed up with us, and we played with the snow, and uh, her hands got cold, so she decided to put her hands in her pocket, and she started to walk back down the summit where Dad was, and her feet got tangled, and so she rolled and hit a rock. And being at that altitude, coming from South Texas, you're you're climbing an altitude that's going to put stress on the body. Yeah. And so my father's a retired doctor, perfectionist achiever, doctor, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's another part of the modeling, um, who had been in Vietnam. So his fear-based uh, beliefs came up, like rather dramatically, and he looked right at me, and he said, if your sister dies, it will be your fault. And I mean, we're sitting here in a, in a, in a space where she is soaked in blood and she is screaming at the top of her lungs. And I'm seven years old. And at that point of trauma, the subconscious mind, which is the emotional part of our mind, has no filter. It's going to take this information in. I'm not going to be able to stop it from influencing my programming. Yeah. Yeah. And so I create a limiting belief of, or a limiting belief is formed at the time of trauma that says, I, I do not trust myself to make the right decision. Wow. And anytime doubt shows up in my life, that belief goes in, in the driver's seat and drives my actions and reactions in life. And I don't know this. This is the problem yeah. is you're not aware of this, right? When you're a little kid. Yeah. So that's how I grew up. I grew up with that trauma kind of pretty much shaping my life, right? I don't, I, at the moment of trauma, I was explained by a therapist later uh, that my father transferred his parental responsibilities onto me. So I mm -hmm. learned the value of responsibility, but as we know, responsibility can be toxic. Yeah. Or, if we, you know, when it's balanced in our body, when the values, it's a beautiful value because it can help us in our life. But yeah. when it flips and becomes unbalanced, then you've got this toxicity where I seek control in all my circumstances when doubt shows up because that pattern of behavior forms at the moment of trauma. Mm -hmm. So I, I lovingly call that pattern of behavior my security seeker. I, I, I seek security. 
every time doubt shows up, right? So that's, that's the trauma that I incurred as a child. I also went through some bullying. That's chapter two of the book. And, yeah. and so there's, there's major trauma going on in my formative years, if you will. And that's who sh- shapes me into, into this perfectionist achiever who does not feel enough or worthy unless she achieves. So I end up in a, in a sales environment in my twenties. Oh, wow. That's a perfect, <laughs> that's a perfect place for, <laughs> for someone like that, um, with that type of mentality. It, trauma is a, has an effect on us because it does. I remember mine and, um, it did not show up until I was in my twenties and I was walking and I've mm-hmm. said this story many times. I was walking on campus and it came like a flood and it overwhelmed me so much that I had to find a place to hide so that I can deal with the emotional, overwhelming emotional uh, um, feeling that was coming upon me. But uh, the trauma comes and how we interpret that trauma as a child will dictate how we behave it will control our relationships mm-hmm. with people. It will control in our first our relationship with ourselves and then with people. And we make uh, decisions based on that. Many of us don't know until we're much older. And those that are, um, I think, uh, Sylvia, those that are hungry, once it becomes aware, those that are hungry to find out, how can I now um, uh, find out where it came from and how can I master this emotional feeling and move through that pain. So you're talking, you mentioned exactly. earlier that there was a lot of trauma that you were experiencing. Uh, that was one of the main ones. That's an intense thing to, for a seven year old to, to, um, to be placed in. As you were saying it, I, I felt my heart just hit the ground. Um, um, but, uh, you experienced that. So talk to me about some other, uh, traumas. You mentioned the bullying aspect as well. And we know what that does to an individual again. Um, uh, so you've experienced some and drove you into the, the perfectionist aspect of, uh, achievement and you ended up in sales. But talk to me a little more of some other, uh, traumas because they do form how we think and our belief system, and I wanted to get in there a little deeper. Sure. Um, a lot of the trauma that occurred after the bullying, the bullying actually created a belief of, I'm not beautiful enough. Mm-hmm. Right? And that belief actually led me to walk down the aisle and marry someone that I was not in love with. Mm-hmm. But because I believed myself not beautiful enough to receive a, uh, another proposal, marriage proposal. Mm-hmm. I said yes to the first marriage proposal that came my way. And when you enter a marriage, and you're, I was walking down the aisle, I remember, and the Holy Spirit was saying, turn around, go back, this isn't the man for you. <laughs> and I, being his strong-willed, stubborn daughter, said, I'm walking down this aisle, I don't care what you're telling me. I need to marry this man. And people that knew me were like, what were you doing? But <laughs> it was because of the bullying. Because yeah. when, when you have um, the, the level of bullying I had, mine started in the ninth grade high school, mm-hmm. which in the United States we know ninth grade is yep. where high school starts. And then it goes all the way through 12th grade. Wow. And so for three, four years, it is emotional bullying because they tried to do physical on me, but I was an athlete. So it was really hard for them to corner me. There were four girls that tried to corner me once, but I was a cross country runner and a tennis player. So I outran them, luckily. <laughs> but the emotional part of it yeah. was, uh, was brutal. Mm-hmm. I, I had a, a boy who had asked me to a dance. And then two days before the dance, he said he couldn't take me because his grandmother had gotten sick. Well, the coward didn't tell me that he had asked another girl to the dance. The problem was the whole new, the whole school knew about it. Wow. And so I'm sitting here hearing him tell me this experience. And 
I remember keeping it together till I got in my mom's car that afternoon and I started to sob. Now, you have to understand my mother was a very bright, shining light in my life. She's very mm-hmm. joyful, very much my, my best friend growing up. She really was the reason why I never truly contemplated suicide mm-hmm. because of the bullying. Um, I, I got in the car and she said, Sylvia, you know, she let me cry it out because I obviously was very distraught. And, um, she said, you have two choices. You can either stay home. And become your bully's victim. Or you can put on your beautiful dress, invite another boy, and have the time of your life. Either way, I'm going to love you. No matter what you choose, I'm going to love you because you're my daughter. Yeah. But it's your choice. And I remember thinking, you know what? I want to have the time of my life. And she had a plan. My mom had a plan. So she called a a friend of hers who had an older son. Mm -hmm. who was four years older than me. So Danny, wherever you're at, (laughs) thank (laughs) you. (laughs) Danny Mercado was the one that took me out. And, and we had the time of life and I was able to face my bullies in person. Wow. You know, but it still leaves that mark, that yes. emotional mark. Uh, it created a belief of I am second choice. And that, that belief comes to, uh, hit me hard in my second marriage because anytime any other woman came into the sphere of my awareness with the men in my life, mm-hmm. that belief came up front and center and, and triggered me immensely because I, I never felt confident in front of another woman, right? And it, and it and but it's subconscious, so I'm not aware of this trauma, right? This is in high school, but it leads me to to accept marriage proposals even though intuitively I knew not to do it. Yeah. Because you see you have that soul identity that is is guiding you in life, but we're not listening to it because we're so busy the fear side of our mind is so powerful mm-hmm. and it dictates a lot of our actions that that soul identity gets crushed underneath that. And all this beauty and love and blessing just gets trampled on by fear. Yeah. And fear takes over. At least it took over for me. And so I, I, I stepped into a marriage not fully being in love with this guy, which wasn't fair to him. Mm-hmm. You know, it was not a fair thing. So I take responsibility for that action I took, but it led to these choices. It steered my choices in life, and they weren't the best choices for me, for the person that I was created to be. I was yeah. created to be a, a, a you know, thoughts of genius. Yeah. Never came to fruition until so an awakening. <laughs> yep, it, it has to come to that place because, as I said, the trauma, the reason why I asked that question about it, I wanted you to go a little deeper because um, uh, from reading some of your things, I can sense that uh, uh, there was some deep trauma there, and I wanted to explore it. I wanted to for uh, the people to know it doesn't matter how dark it gets, and um, I always try my best to uh, make them aware that that is when the creator that is in you will shine. Because um, you don't need the creator in you and all is well. Actually, when God was finished mm-hmm. creating, he went and relaxed a little. He took a little break. He's like, oh, I got to chill out. <laughs> so um, <laughs> he didn't need to be there. But when the creator needed to show up, it says that he said, let there be light. And so he did his creation just like you and I will have to do the same thing, the same process. He laid out the blueprint so that you and I can look at it and um, get -hmm. some insights and apply it in our lives and do the same thing if we model ourselves after what took place there. So, Sylvia, talk to me. You are in college now. Um, How old were you when you were uh, your first married? My first marriage, I was 24. 24 okay, so old, you're so in, I'm already in college. Like the, well, no, I'm past college now. Past college. I'm okay. past college now. How I was went college? From high school to marriage. Okay. College was an interesting, it, it was an interesting uh, time because I actually studied abroad. I lived in France for about a year 
And I had moved abroad uh, because the year before I had accepted another marriage proposal. And this guy was, unbeknownst to me, a serial cheater. <laughs> and I didn't know this <laughs> until I caught him with with a girl because once again my intuition kicked in and I listened to it and one night I and I detail this so much in the book when I catch him it's at one o'clock in the morning and I'm this you know what nineteen year old college student mm-hmm. and I go up the steps and I know he's in her apartment because I, I've seen this woman before and there's something about her that does not ring true for me. And I I knock on the door and I say, you know, her name. And I say, open the door. I know he's in there. And she opens the door and she has a smirk on her, on her face, like saying, he got you. Like he's with me. And I see him and he's putting on his clothes. And I, and I very firmly tell him, uh, it's over. And I turn around and I walk back in my car and I, and I drive at a very high rate of speed. I call my mother, you know, my saving grace. And she says, get a, a friend to take you somewhere else because he's going to try to convince you to, to get back with him. So I need you to leave that dorm room and go somewhere else. And so I go and I knock on my friend's door and she calls her parents and she drives me to East Texas somewhere. And it, and she's my saving grace, like this friend of mine, Christy. Yeah. And I spend the weekend at her parents' house recovering from from this trauma. And, um, I come back and, and, uh, and there he, he is, he's trying to get back with me. And so that's traumatic, right? Yes. And, yes. and my junior year, my college professors who love me and they see the light in me, they want me to shine. So the environment that we have around us is so important, right? We mm-hmm. want to be, uh, surrounded by people that have our best interests at heart. And the late Cynthia Manley, who was the head of the French department, said, I've already talked to your parents. We've all decided you're moving <laughs> abroad. <laughs> we're we're, we're going to fill out the paperwork and you're going to go to Leon because you need to get away from this right. scenario. And so I move. I'm, I'm from Texas, so the United States, and I moved mm. to Leon, France, my junior year in college. And it was the best move I ever made for me. But now I'm in a foreign country with a broken heart. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's, it's talking about this chapter three and, and chapter four where I introduce the blueprint of what, uh, how you can use a turning point to really shift the lens of your life and really turn inward, uh, for your answers to see if you're operating from ego identity or soul identity. And, and, and God at that moment of trauma placed a desire in my heart to become fluent in French and to and to study abroad. So I moved to France and, and that's, that's my college years. <laughs> Another trauma. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you <laughs> because why le- not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're learning. I think, um, uh, the, I'm learning tons the, of lessons. <laughs> here you are because you're now being able to create what you have created as a result of walking through those traumas so that, um, you, when someone presents to you, that are in that type of trauma, the, the, I call, I tell people in my background, Christianity, we call it the anointing that when you began to speak, you speak from this place of knowing. And because you speak from this place of knowing, because it, it is a part of you, it is more powerful exactly. than someone who, um, hasn't been through it. Um, there's one, I, part of your story that you were talking about and I tell people to pay attention to that inner voice because that's the part that is truly you the yes. um, man has learned how to manipulate the five senses and thank God he can't manipulate that voice because if he does then everything is over we're done with but um, the that if we listen to that voice, I, I always, uh, give the advice that it will save you much pain and, um, much trauma. But we, again, we don't pay attention to it because like, you know, we look at the five senses and we allow the five senses to govern us. But as I mentioned, people can manipulate those five senses. So here you are. You're in Paris now. 
you're having a good time, you're enjoying some good food and cheese and and a nice <laughs> smelling breeze and air. You know, Paris is just beautiful. So how did you now, it, this uh, newness of a location, how did Sylvia, the person, manage herself there? It's an interesting question because for the first month and a half or so, there's a lot of excitement, mm-hmm. right? You want to be there. It's Everything's new. But then uh, two months in, that's when our friend, fear-based um, ego, shows its face. Mm-hmm. And I have a story that's really interesting. Uh, it's a funny story, and this is where ego shows up for me. I... I lived with a, a French father and a French mother in Lyon, France. And so they decided a month into my, my stay there to invite their daughters, their older daughters, and their boyfriends over for a dinner. So here I am, the only American student, and everybody else is French. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Having dinner. <laughs> and, you know, of course, we know the French love their six courses, right? Yep. And they're passing on, I think it's the fourth course. And I think I'm saying I'm full. No, thank you. I don't want any more. Instead, what I say is, no, thank you. I'm pregnant, but not pregnant like a human would be pregnant. Pregnant like a cow would be pregnant. So, so, you know, these guys are trying so hard not to burst out laughing at this exchange student, right? And I mean... You know, the thoughts that go through your mind of like, yeah. shut up, don't say anything. You see, <laughs> why did you think you could do this? Yeah. That's ego showing mm-hmm. up, right? And, um, and it takes, it takes strength and courage to say, what is the desire that God plays in my heart? I yeah. want to be fluent and I want to study abroad. And for that to happen, I've got to stick this out. Right. Yes. So my French father asked me, do you want to know what you said? And and then he says it in English. And mm-hmm. I say, yes. And and the very next day, you know what I did? Mm-hmm. I went out and I observed the French. I sat in the metro station and I wanted to become them. Mm-hmm. I wanted to like immerse myself in their culture. And that meant dressing like them, eating like them, uh, conversing like them, uh, using the same slang as them. And that's what I started to do model them yeah right? and i immerse myself in this culture until like six months came around and then my father being a very wise man said i think you need to stay six more months because he really didn't like this guy i was dating so for me to really like get over him yeah. he thought the male perspective was like stay abroad i yeah. will pay for it it's no big deal and so i stayed the full year abroad in uh, my junior year abroad um in the young fans. And I had an incredible time because I pushed past my ego and I turned inward a lot more for my answers. And that's where God showed up a great deal during my time in France. And I became closer to him uh, in periodic spurts because I was still very young and I was still listening to my ego yeah. a lot more, right? Um, but I emerged uh, fluent in French. So my soul identity, I I lined up with the desire that God placed in my heart. By the end of the sojourn, I looked French. I looked European. They could not tell I was American. I spoke mm-hmm. fluent French. And so I achieved, you know, the goal that God set out from the beginning, Yeah, you know, in France. Yeah. And that's how I pushed through it because ego will show up, yeah. no doubt about it. Because your programming is there and it's been there for a long time. And when you give it new change it comes up it comes to up. see if you truly want the change mm-hmm. or not you know it's just kind of testing you um and i i was strong enough and strong-willed enough that i pushed right past the ego and said not staying regardless of what was happening at austin college and there was plenty happening because my mm-hmm. former fiance was now engaged again to uh-huh. another girl and i had learned through letters from people writing to me saying you need to come back and i was like no i really don't <laughs> because I'm in alignment with my soul yeah. and my soul's desires, and that is to stay here abroad. That is awesome. That's how I manage myself. That is, that's a great story. I think that's a beautiful story. One of the things that you had mentioned um, 
that uh, if anyone is listening, they always hear me say this. And I, I call it the, uh, the find your statement of faith. And the reason why I say that is that this statement, you have to believe it with everything within you. And uh, you made a statement after you were embarrassed with, at the dinner. You said, I am going to be like them. I'm going to learn the language. I am going to look, dress the part. And as you, uh, once you made that statement, you believed it enough to then um, uh, apply the work that is necessary to accomplish what you spoke. And the Bible says, faith without works is dead. So if you don't apply that um, the necessary uh, work that is needed to accomplish it, you would have never done it. But it, uh, I tell people, once you find that statement, it will guide your life for a period of time until you're at another state uh, area in your life where you need another statement to move you through to the next stage. So you did not go back after everyone. You've gotten closer to God and uh, you're working on that relationship. And now you are looking in deeper and now you are back in the United States of America. Talk to me, Sylvia. You land on the plane. You, you ran in. You kissed everyone. And you're back in the, the case of all the mix with all the, the good stuff happening. Tell me when your world started shaking again. My world started shaking again going down that aisle. Honestly, going mm. down that aisle with that first husband. And that's knowing that I'm making a, a dreadful, you know, mistake, but yeah. still moving through it, uh, because I'm operating from a fear based ego and and the next nine years are mm-hmm. tumultuous because i i my father gets sick uh they i uh, they by the grace of god they found a brain tumor um mm. he happened to be in his clinic and they said hey we're gonna test the mri machines you know do you want to be the guinea pig and so he gets put in there and that's how they discovered this brain tumor and this happens mm. like Oh, I don't know, like five years into our marriage. And I, um, we decided to have a baby right after that. And so my father could experience being a grandfather. And, uh, and I have my baby boy and I, and I'm going through all this trauma. And then, um, our son is about four years old and a hurricane is in South Texas and our house is without electricity. And, at this point, we had been in therapy for a couple of months, my, my first husband and I, and um, he's rocking in the chair that we used to rock our little boy to sleep and he asked me a question of, how long have we been in therapy? And I said, well, about seven months. And he said, and he just keeps rocking back and forth. And mind you, our little boy is in the next room mm-hmm. playing quietly with his toys. And he says, um, I think we should get a divorce. Hmm. And it just kind of like rattles me, right? Yeah. Um, because once again, it's, Fear-based ego is getting kicked, right? Yeah. It's an, an ego, a swift kick to the ego. It's not necessarily that I was in love with him and I wanted to stay with him, but I also was thinking of our son mm-hmm. and what this would do to him, right? The, the effects of a divorce would do to him. And so I beg him. I beg him to reconsider. And he sort of reconsiders, but no, he sticks to his guns. And we decide to get a divorce. And somewhere deep inside of me, I actually felt relief when we got a divorce. I would never admit it at the moment, but in reflection, I went back and, and in the book, I really looked at these years very critical, you know, with a, with a coaching eye. Yeah. You know, like if I, from the coaching perspective, what, what was happening with my subconscious mind, my conscious mind at the moment, right? And so the divorce really is where my, Earth starts to shatter significantly. This is 2009 now. So now I'm 34 years old. And, uh, and I start that journey of singlehood, right? But it triggers in me, I'm not enough gets triggered, yeah. right? Into full action. And I start working 50 to 60 hour work weeks. And that perfectionist achiever in me is in full display. Because mm-hmm. about seven months before he asked for the divorce, my company finally promotes me after 
denying me promotions for the previous three years at Pfizer. I get this hospital promotion and I enter a, a territory you know, on sales yeah. that was second to last. And my regional vice president has my territory under a microscope and basically has told me, you have very limited time to turn that territory around or you can find yourself pretty much with another job. Hmm. That was the kind of like the extent of it. So I now I'm working 50 to 60 hour work weeks. I am maintaining my home with my son. I am now a divorced woman. And the same year he asked for a divorce and the same year I got the promotion, I turned that territory around to the number one territory for Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, which is not an easy thing to do. Wow. Yeah. But it comes at a cost oh, yeah. because I have now um, worked so hard that my son probably developed a limiting belief of I'm not enough. Yeah. Because work is more important for mom. Right? And it triggers this, this, this sentiment in him. And I now have done what my father essentially did to me. Yeah. And I am not aware of it. I, it's not out of that. It's, it's the responsibility going toxic, turning toxic and being triggered and acting from a fear based ego space. Yeah. That's, um, I can attest to the same list, similar story. I'm listening to yours and I'm laughing because something similar happened with my first marriage as well. And I knew uh, God was telling me <laughs> this is not the one, but <laughs> you know how things are and how uh, crazy we are. We just go ahead and do what we, we, we do. But, um, uh, out of the relationship, I have my boys and then. I am in love with them to a degree. I understand some of the, um, the force that drives our father, um, when he loves someone, how, what he does for them. So here you are, you've crashed and burned in the sense of a relationship, excelling in the professional arena. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, of course I love, I'm, I'm from sales in, in, um, in the medical arena as well. So I understand some of the oh, things that you better. had to push through to accomplish. And to do that is, um, uh, unless you're in the industry, you're not going to know what a tremendous uh, um, accomplishment that was that you had accomplished. So congratulations, you know, on that. I know exactly what that is about because I have a lot of friends within that same space. So here you are, you've. You are, you, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to take this journey, Sylvia, to, to, to find out when you crash and burn and then you start really going into, to the other aspects of it. But this is so good as to how much you went through and the wisdom that you've gained from it. And I want them, the audience to get the, the richness that is you, uh, so that when they reach out to, to you, they know that this is someone that they can, uh, one of the things that they will have to deal with when you're coming to someone new is trust. And the fact that you've gone through this, they can feel, is my hope that they feel that they can trust you because you've gone there. Um, you've gone through now, you're going through the divorce and uh, you reacted several different ways, the breaking down and the acceleration within the, the corporate world. I love that that dichotomy there. So um, as you are moving through this now and uh, you're, you notice some of the things within your son, uh, talk to me as to when you, um, Sylvia, when you, you had your final crash and burn, as they say, where you're like, okay, I get it. Something is going on here that I need to really dig, dig deep, deep, deep and come out with the answers because I know um, the, my, my pastor used to say the Holy Spirit is the hound of heaven. So I know when that, uh, the hound of heaven <laughs> is coming at you and, oh. and, um, y you know, talk to me when, <laughs> when he finally when got you. Happened? What was it? <laughs> because I know what it is, but I want you to talk about what it was and then we'll proceed from there. Absolutely. Um, so about three years. 
into the divorce. So this is now two, almost 2011, end of 2011, I meet who I think is the one. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I start dating this guy. And yeah. he, three months or four months into it, says, I want your son to meet my family. So I'm inviting you to Easter to Louisiana because that's where he's from. And it's a big deal in Louisiana. They have a crawfish boil. And, you know, as a single mom with a young son, you you don't get many offers like those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I I want to go. Yeah. Right? But a couple of days before I leave, I start getting this pain right below my my right side, uh, above my ribcage. And my brother, because my brother at this point and my sister are now both doctors. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom insists you need to consult with your brother because you don't look good. I had turned pale, and I every time I took a breath, there was pain. And so I consult with him, and he's like, you're fine. You know, typical sibling doctor. Mm-hmm. For those that are doctors out there, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you don't deal with your family members the same way you do with a patient. And so he's like, you're fine. You know, just take this. I was exercising seven days a week. I was 36 years old. And I was in perfect condition. And so he's like, oh, it's probably the inflammation of the lining of the lung. It's very common in young people. So just take this medicine for five days. But I'm warning you, it's really painful. So I take a flight from South Texas to Houston. And uh, we spend the night. And in the middle of the night, I jolted awake. It felt like 50 knives were piercing my chest Mm. simultaneously. And a prompting came through very urgently and said, lean forward and you'll be able to breathe. And that's really the first miracle I received on Good Friday, early morning on Good Friday. And I go in and we, we drive to St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital the very next day because this is unlike that pain. And once my brother understands that I've taken a flight, he's like, you need to get to the ER immediately. So I walk in unassisted. My little boy is the second time he's met my boyfriend. So mind you, as a single mom, this is a big deal. Um, They're outside parking the car, and I walk in unassisted, and they do a scan of my lungs. And a a specialist walks into my ER room and says, a woman in your condition should not be sitting up talking to me. You have two large pulmonary embolisms in your left lung. And for those that don't know what a pulmonary embolism is, basically blood that clotted, it yep. traveled up your leg through your veins and had to pass through the heart to get to your left lung. And that's what this guy explains to me. Because yeah. you know that pain felt, felt last night? Oh, yeah, it should have stopped your heart with the, yeah. the size of these things. <laughs> my dad. Uh, and so I'm sitting there stunned, right? Because mm-hmm. I, I'm not leaving here anytime soon. And so th- I get admitted in stable condition. And the very next day, he said, we still need to take a closer look because the scan revealed that the liver was inflamed and they didn't understand why. And any organ that's inflamed is a bad idea. Mm. So I go in thinking, okay, what could this be? And the next day they do another scan and six doctors walk into my room. And, you know, being in sales, I had Mm -hmm. learned to read a room rather quickly. (laughs) And neither one of them is looking me straight in the eye. So I know the news is grim. And the specialist starts. He says, we have a real problem. And he said, you, we're running against time. The therapy we're giving you is not really uh, the right therapy, but we have no choice at this point. You have a blood clot, and it has basically blocked off most of your blood supply to your organs, and your liver is about to go into liver failure, and you're going to require a transplant. We're going to get you fast. Wow. So you see the three doctors on your right, and I looked. And they're on the transplant team, and they're now on your case. So right now I'm faced with not just pulmonary embolism, which one usually kills a person. I had multiple throughout. Oh. And then I have this thing that's just threatening my life. And unbeknownst to me, they had given my family a 20% chance of my survival. I did, obviously did not know it at the time. Mm-hmm. So when they when they go through the a hundred lists of side effects of the therapy they're about to put me on and they get to death and hemorrhagic stroke, my mind just kind of goes blank. And in a moment of terror, I decide to surrender to God. Hmm. Totally surrender and accept my fate, whatever's waiting for me in ICU. And that act of surrender frees me 
like I've never felt freedom before. In mm-hmm. my life. And um, the next morning, it's Easter Sunday morning, and a woman with a Catholic diocese walks into my room and asks if we want to play with her. And at this point, we don't know what's happened. If, if the therapy doesn't work, they're going to have to go in there a lot more aggressively, and that meant death in my case. So we don't want that. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. And so we start to pray, and, and it's Donnie, the, the lady and I, were, we're praying to our Father, and, and a love so immense covered the entire room, and I felt like I was being cradled in mm-hmm. God's loving arms, and I remember a feeling of peace washing over me and a knowing I was okay. So here's the second miracle that I received on Easter Sunday morning is his visit and mm. the knowing. Yeah. And the third and final miracle was like 20 minutes later when they go in there to see what the therapy has done. And the baffled reaction of the, of the doctors is what really catches me off guard because they are incredulous. How mm-hmm. did I not have long-term complications from what mm. I had? Because they were expecting, fully expecting that. And it was as if I had never had pulmonary embolisms, any threat in my body. Wow. Totally clean, which is a rare, a rarity in that kind of diagnosis. Third wow. and final miracle I received. So this is a major turning point. It wakes me up. It's obviously something like this had to happen. Yeah. And I always call this my greatest blessing. Yeah. And I thank God for my near death experience because it woke me up to what was truly important in my life. I, I looked at it very, very critically. And now I am like asking him, what is my divine soul purpose? Because I don't feel like you put me, like I went through this just because. I yeah. think there's a big powerful reason why I survived and more importantly why I received three miracles from you. And I want to know why. And I start this quest into personal growth and development and really start to shift my lens of my life, make these hard choices that really seemed impossible prior to this event. Yeah. And that's the turning point that really woke me up. I, I came there as well. It was a near-death experience that caused me to make my turning point. So um, uh, congratulations on the hard-headed people like you and I who came out of it alive. So um, <laughs> uh, it was one of the things that did, the same to me and, and ushered me in my path that I am now in. Um, those were tremendous uh, miracles that were done on your behalf. And I tell people all the time, God is real. The Holy Spirit is real. Jesus is real. This is no oh, joke. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's, uh, God is here to help and he's here to do everything to get you to a space of victory. He says, God is not willing that any should perish. That's why he is long suffering. But here you are. You've, you've gotten uh, your deliverance and you, you surrendered. And I tell people, uh, Sylvia surrendering. Jesus had to do it also. And, um, his battle was so intense that I read he, he was sweating blood because he had this battle with surrendering to his father and the will that, uh, was to be done and carried out. And then after he finished all of that, he said, all right, all right, man. All right. I surrender. Not my will, but thy will be done. And then the, yeah. um, uh, all the things began to happen to cause him, uh, to be on that cross. So here you are and, um, you've gone through, you surrendered and, uh, you're at your family. I know you, you did, you, you said earlier, you had, this is your second husband, so you're married now. And I want to ask you something, Sylvia, about this thing that you were dealing with your entire life, about the less than think, thinking. What was it? Um, how did you begin to learn to fall in love with Sylvia? When the pandemic actually hit is when I finally learned the lesson in self-love. The Hmm. very last chapter of Journey to Me is where I truly dived in. Now, where it started to, where that journey started was in 2016, 17, I went back to therapy 
because I truly wanted to get to the root of why I was self-sabotaging so much. Yeah. Because even though I woke up and I surrendered, I still, that ego identity was so strong. Oh, yeah. And that programming was so strong, I still had not become aware until I become a coach. Then I start to understand the power of the mind and how it has driven my my actions. So when I become a coach in 2017, I start working on myself even more. And now I'm in therapy once again. And Cynthia is instrumental in helping me see my light and plants the seed. You need to write a book. You have so much wisdom inside of you. Your life is so rich in wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so God sends her as a messenger in 2016, 17, and it starts planting that seed, which we know it takes a little bit of time for us, yeah. stubborn children, to move folks. in that yeah. direction. Right? Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the pandemic hits in 2020, and that's when this prompting really starts hard. And at this point in my relationship with Christ, now I turn inward for my answers. And this takes me, you know, some years to master, right? So we're talking about this from 2017 to 2020 is when I've been tuning into God and answering his promptings on schedule. Like when he prompts, I act. Yeah, yeah. And He's been showing me my path, right? And so in 2020, when he says, write your book, it's time, trust me. I don't question him. I put pen to paper and I start putting the pages, you know, and the book starts to come into fruition. Mm -hmm. And it's in the writing of the book that I finally see the programming of my subconscious mind and how I had believed these lies that were simply not true anymore. Yeah. They might have been true at the beginning. When I was seven years old, eight years old, but when I, when I shifted my focus around, when I actually saw the blessing of what these turning points gave me, the lessons I learned and how these lessons actually brought light into my world, because that's what the chapters do. I, I give you a, a lesson in each chapter and how that lesson played a role in my life, in the richness of my life. To become this person that I became, I see God's hand in the entire thread. I see that every time I turn to him, he shows me the way and I emerge into my light and power. And I have fully stepped into that master plan for his life. And once I understand the concept of loving him first, do I understand the concept of self-love? Once I see myself the way that God saw me in the writing of the book, he shows me and reveals to me, this is, this is you. This is your light for you. Do you see how beautiful you've gone through your life? Despite the pain, you worked through mm -hmm. the pain. But look at everything you gained from all these turning points. And look how you beautifully wove them into your life's thread. And look at the results. I want you to pat yourself on the back. So yeah. And then it's when I finally see it, that to me was the Understanding of self-love is loving God first and loving how when I acted on this prompting, everything I learned and everything, all the abundance that came to me because of the lessons of the pain and the suffering that I went through. And in chapter 15, I, I'm able to, to turn things around for myself. I'm able to to see my light in its in like in its brightness and its vibrancy and truly thank myself and thank my earlier versions of me, the one that made all those you know, perceived mistakes, you know, the one that operated from fear for so long. I thank her and I bless her and I lovingly let her go. And now I stand in this space as an author, as as a speaker, as a training points coach and and I now feel the joy in the journey and I see I see the the true sense of me and and I'm loving it. I'm loving being in this space. I I love myself. I know I'm enough. I tell myself often I am enough. I am 
an author and I've stepped fully into that master plan for my life willingly and without, you know, with, without fear anymore. That is beautiful. I, the Bible says, uh, Sylvia, and I love this scripture, the disciples come to Jesus and they said, what's the greatest of all the commandments? And he said, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And when he's saying this, if you understand what he's talking about, he's talking about the individual. We, the Bible teaches that the human uh, um, experience, the human is a spirit, have a soul, and lives in a body. So you have these three parts of it. It says that to love that, uh, love your God with all your heart, which speaks to your spirit, with all your soul, which is your mind, he says, all your mind, which speaks to your soul, and with all your strength, which speaks to your body. And then he says, out of this relationship, he says that the second is just as great, that you love your neighbor as you love yourself. So then, to me, when I saw that and I got the, 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 the insight into this thing, is that from your relationship with your God, you learn uh, you're going to look at, you're going to learn forgiveness because you're going to look and see how messed up you are. Um, you're going to learn about love because you see that you're messed up and he still love you. You're going to learn about forgiveness because my God, I'm messed up and he still love me. And I, and so you learn all these uh, powerful lessons from this relationship so that when you turn to someone now, that uh, because of you've experienced this relationship with your God, I can love someone and not be judgmental with them because he was not judgmental with me. And if I am judgmental with someone else, I am a hypocrite. I am not learning what that love is. And I need to go back in to that relationship to get the answers about what is love and how it, it, how I can translate it once I've received it from him. How can I translate it to another human spirit? And that is the beautiful thing as we have this, this interaction, this exchange with God. To me, that's one of the most beautiful relationships. I love that relationship because it gets, it shows me, um, about me and the capability of how deeper I can get out of this relationship. And here you are. God has brought you through so much. He got you to put the pen of paper. You have now cooked a wonderful dish by which people can partake of this journey. And uh, Sylvia, I always tell people, I want you guys to buy her books. I want you to get in touch with her, but more so buy her books because, I, as I've said and you've heard me said it before, now, when you buy a book from an author, you're having a one-on-one -on -one, um, conversation with him or her. It's private, find your space. And because when you read that stuff, there's so much wisdom, there's so much power within those pages, within those words. And I guarantee you, because there's power within those pages, they're going to leap into that spirit of yours and cause you to ask questions. And then you get in touch with Sylvia and you, 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 you get on her case and she is going to love it. And she will bring you into some of those other classes that she can take you deeper into what's there, how to recognize it, how to move through and become the best human spirit while you're here on this earth. Sylvia, I want to thank you for coming to Threads of Enlightenment. This was good stuff, girl. <laughs> I enjoyed it. You had me go down memory lane, and it was fun. It was a it was a joy to be here with each of you. <laughs> Thank you. I told you that I will ask different questions because I, I was sure. telling you about, about those questions that I was reading that we we can ask you. And I want to know about you, the power that is you, about the power of your journey, because I want people to identify with you to know that. They are not alone, number one. Don't take your life. Um, Sylvia has gone through much. If you're going through that, get in touch with her. She will make sure and encourage you not to take your life. And uh, I want you guys to, to reach out to her so that she can walk you through from that dark place to look. And um, she's going to question, ask those questions that you are so busy 
that you don't know what to ask because she's been through it. So she knows what to ask to get the results that she is living so that you can experience that. Silver, again, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. It was such a pleasure to be here.